So as we talk about surgery and epithelial ovarian cancer, there's really four components. The one, risk-reducing surgery, which can include uh, what you call, Brian, ISDO, interval salpingectomy, delayed oophorectomy. Second, a staging operation, tumors that are generally of early stage, do you want to see if it's spreading, lymphadenectomy, peritoneal assessment, washings, and omentectomy. And then third, debulking. Okay, and certainly the fourth would be secondary debulking. Let's now start, though. We're not going to talk about staging. We're going to talk about debulking. And about half of our patients are getting interval debulking, meaning starting with neoadjuvant. And that began in 2010 with the EORTC 55971, published in the New England Journal by Dr. Vergoat. But at the SGO 2019, there was a third study, second being course, and we'll talk about that in a minute, a third study called the SCORPIN trial. Tell us about the score pin trial, Katie. So the, so the trial you alluded to, the ERTC study, uh, the subsequent CORUS study, the subsequent study out of the Japanese um, group, all kind of randomized, kind of all comers advanced disease to surgery, no surgery. And they had different nuances and, and areas where people could criticize. One of the main criticisms of all those studies, but especially CORUS and ERTC, amongst believers in primary side reduction is there wasn't a lot of effort there. Right. Um, that you didn't have surgeons who really believed that they were going for, you know, um, a complete uh, side reduction to an R0, as some would say. So the SCORPION trial, I was truthfully very excited about because that was the study that really was going to kind of put that hypothesis to the test. So you took women who had a, a laparoscopy initially and had a Fagoti score. So the Fagoti score is well established and it kind of scores based on where you see disease. And if you had a Fagoti score greater than eight, that usually um, uh, uh, references patients actually to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In this case, uh, this group said, okay, we're gonna take that group of patients with really bulky disease and we're gonna randomize them to neoadjuvant versus upfront surgery with really aggressive intent to get to no gross residual. Uh, and, so, and they did that. When you look at their surgical effort and times, they really did it. They did radical surgeries. They achieved no gross residual over 60% of the time in the primary side reductive group. Um, they did everything kind of we said was missing from the other studies, and yet they showed absolutely no difference right. in progression for your overall survival despite that. And so that's the fourth study now. Um, really telling us that there's no difference between primary side reduction and, and neoadjuvant. So Brian, what are the themes here? Um, we have a number of studies comparing primary debulking versus neoadjuvant and interval debulking. What are the themes? What are the take home messages for our audience? Yeah, I'm, one of the themes is that um, when it comes to the surgery, it's important that you're getting treated in a high volume center, yep. in a center that does a lot of these cases. You don't want to be, um, to give the, the physician a choice, surgery or no surgery, someone who doesn't do a lot of these cases. You want to be in someone's hands who's really experienced in going both, in, in deciding to do neoadjuvant or to do upfront, um, to do upfront surgery. Uh, the, the, one of the keys here in, in, in regard to Katie's comments that, that weren't highlighted on, while there was a similar outcome in the two groups, there was a much higher rate of, uh, of post-operative adverse events in those patients That's that were the operative. second theme. High volume center and neoadjuvant is always less morbid. Le less morbid. And when we're talking, I mean, th th these women are our mothers, our sisters, our, our neighbors. Um, we want to get them home. We want to help maintain their quality of life. And if we're going to have same clinical outcomes, we need to put that into the forefront as far as quality of life outcomes matter. And if a patient can get home sooner and have the same outcome, why not offer that to our patients? And the third theme also is that the neoadjuvant patients probably don't do quite as well as patients who have primary debulking where the tumor can be resected and the patient can survive it. So Elena, there's this discussion that maybe you should look in with the laparoscope. Since you really prefer to do a primary debulking, since CAT scan probably is not sufficiently sensitive, how do you feel about looking in with a laparoscope and trying to triage patients to primary debulking versus neoadjuvant chemotherapy? 
So, you know, this is another field where so much is changing. Um, so much of our debulking surgeries we do now laparoscopically or robotically. Um, and, you know, there's now some thought, which we as surgeons are not accepting well, is that ovarian cancer might actually not be surgical disease after all. After <laughs> all this time, we believed that, you know, every you little... You believed, I didn't believe that. I don't believe either. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's what people say. Um, that w where we believe that every ditzel matters. Now it all might be biology of disease and, right. and not this... And, incredible surgical effort that we always put into this. So yes, I, I very much am a supporter of looking with the camera and deciding whether somebody can be debulked at the time. But I'm also just like Brian, you know, I think quality of life is key. And if I can get somebody to a better quality of life easier, if I can do their surgery robotically after new adjuvant chemotherapy, but would need a laparotomy up front, I will choose the former. I will choose giving them some chemotherapy, allowing this laparoscopic minimally invasive surgery where they go home same day or next morning and change the course of the recovery. I think the evolution has been that since many patients, maybe half, get neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and that in and of itself has a prognostic significance, that in that group of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, there still are prognostic groups, and that would be the surgical complexity score that you see on laparoscopy, certainly age. Older patients do worse, and then also the amount of residual disease at the interval to bulking. So, um, do you guys do laparoscop laparoscopy triage? Yeah, I think that's yeah. that's evolving. What percent, Brian, do you think in the country have neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Yeah, and you, um, I think I think it's higher. I think it's probably higher than than we th yeah. than we even have the numbers for. You know, I think it's important when we're. It, I'm okay with neoadjuvant. I'm, I'm a proponent for neoadjuvant. But those patients prior to initiating their care for their ovarian cancer should be seen. Um, in, in conjunction with a medical oncologist by their G1 oncologist who will be performing the surgery. Again, it's okay to go with chemo first, but the patient, we need to have that discussion with the patient and come up with a plan for surgery after the three or six cycles right from the start. And, and that's what ASCO guidelines say, right? There's been an opinion paper by the American Society of Clinical Oncology that says before you start chemotherapy, and, and, and gynecologists can give chemotherapy, we're all gynecologic oncologists, but have the patient evaluated by what you said a high volume surgeon. Because you may come up, I mean, back to Dr. Ratner's point, there is individualization, individualization of the surgical approach, and I don't disagree with anything um, Dr. Slomovich just said, but, but we were talking earlier, there's a meta-analysis of the neoadjuvant trials that does suggest that patients with lower volume disease, less yes. than five centimeters, uh, actually benefit more from primary side reduction. Yeah. So there may be a group of patients for whom primary side reduction actually does impact their progression-free and overall survival. And so while I want to maintain safety for my patients, and we all do, mm -hmm. I want them to live as long as they can too. And so in the past, you know, in the past at my institution, we operate on everybody. And in fact, if you did neoadjuvant, we were kind of accused of giving up early. Right. Um, and the, t the complications were the, the price of doing business to help your patient live longer. Yeah. Now I think we have more of a balance, but the pendulum shouldn't switch. In, in, swing so far. In, in fairness, though, that, that Vergot, EORTC chorus um, meta-analysis in Lancet Oncology in 2018 also showed that in stage four patients, neoadjuvant trended to do better. Absolutely. 